start, and so I have the privilege to uh, moder moderate this particular workshop. We've, this is our third CERTs, and so every year that we've been uh, participating in CERTs, it's all about you know, pushing the conversation and really going from year to year, what is the United States doing in regards to the issues in regards to workforce? And so, um, can I get somebody to close the doors? Jacob, if you can help us. If we can close the doors in the back, please. Appreciate it. Paul, if you can help us with the doors in the back, please. So, from year to year, we, we've really tried to focus here at CERTs, you know, what can we provide in terms of recommendations? Uh, if you recall last year from General Call, the call to action, we were really key on what recommendations could we really focus to move the workforce initiatives so that they actually have traction. And it was great to have the presentation by uh, Doug Rapp yesterday, yesterday from Indiana. So two years ago, they implemented their cyber strategy within the state. And based on their implement implementation of the strategy and support from the governor, they found that two years later, they were able to achieve 72% of the goals that they had on that strategy. So what's the theme from that is, you know, putting in a strategy is, is not in itself enough. You have to have buy-in from leadership. You have to execution and partnerships across. And you have to have communications down to the workforce to understand what the strategy is. So the key with this particular workshop on Retain is to identify what thoughts, concepts, ideas that you may have, get that, uh, through this session, and so at the end, we can provide three things that we think are going well within RETAIN, and that can come from government, industry, academia, research, uh, and having your perspectives to deliver those three. And then the three things, uh, Mike refers to them as the low three. I like to think of it as three things that I think we can provide in terms of recommendations, right, for organizations to really focus on and seriously consider whether it's the government, the DOD, DHS, industry, academia to put into their own action items. And so to here to help me today, I have two fantastic volunteers uh, mm -hmm. from this space and I'm gonna allow them to introduce themselves. But first of all, we have Colonel Janelle Nelson and we have Diana Ornberger. So Janelle's uh, reservist, with the uh, Air Force, and she's out of SOCOM, and, but she's also a civilian with the Navy in Nebraska, I believe, right? And then... <laughs> she'll tell the story. <laughs> and Diana, Diana is the Deputy Dean for the College of Cyber at the National Cryptologic School up at NSA. Yes. So, Colonel. Okay. Um, can everybody hear me? All right, so I, my, in my SOCOM job, I am the senior reservist to the J6. So I get to see kind of firsthand our hiring issues. Um, and I see it also on the SOCOM, or on the STRATCOM side. By the way, the Navy's there because NIWIC is there building the new STRATCOM headquarters. So my team um, was doing some of the C2 mission systems moving over to the new facility. Um, but imagine this, so we had a forensic shop and STRATCOM is their own CNDSP. They run their own network because they have a lot of national security systems. We had a forensics team of eight people. We, today, there's one. We train these people on the technologies they need to do their job and we can't keep them because they are getting offered so much money. And really, IT across the board, the other problem we face is there's such a backup at OPM trying to get our fills, and our fills are about two sheets long in the J6, that you know that when you ask them and, and you tell them these are my hot priority fills, that you can only real, realistically expect that they're gonna fill about three of them. You know you've got two pages of a need, but you're only gonna get about three of them filled. And, um, and a lot of the problem is we get these people on, we train them, they're taken away from us. We kind of joke that they're poached, but they're always being poached. So how do we keep them? We already heard from another panel that we have to train them. That's an incentive to get them to stay on, but now we're making them worth more money and they're getting picked up by industry. So just kind of think about that maybe today. Help me out. Okay. 
hear me without the, okay, okay. Um, so I am the Deputy Dean for the College of Cyber. It doesn't really have an academic flair. Basically, I'm the chief of the administrative portion of it. We at NSA have a huge retention problem for the same reason. Our personnel are working alongside contractors that make a lot more money. The one thing that tends to keep people is the mission. So we started several initiatives that you might have already heard about. We have the Night of Cyber that's targeted to fourth and fifth grade teachers that we hold annually during the Computer Science for All Week in December. We kind of target those teachers and come into their classrooms and kind of get those kids with the mind of math is important, science is important, and we can move you along and hopefully they will participate in a Gen Cyber Camp. So we run the Gen Cyber program and it's at no cost to any parent. Students all go for free. Some are residential, so it's paid for food, um, lodging, everything. There could be no charge to the parents. They're run throughout the nation. And from there, we're hoping that those same students will join a center of academic excellence. So we have two programs, one in cyber defense and one in cyber operations. And then we actively recruit from those schools from those specific programs. So we're hoping all along that will help us for our retention program because in their minds, they know that we're a good place to work and it's a good mission to come to. But we still, once they're there and they've been there for a certain period of time, we have the same challenge. They're ready to move on to something else. We can't compete when it comes to money. We have some incentive programs, but we'll never come close to what's offered in industry. Um, I shared with Janelle and Glenn over lunch that we were even looking for someone in academia to lead up our College of Cyber and even the NCS, and we couldn't come close to the salary of someone in academia with the same credentials. So we've got to figure out a way to grow people and keep them in our field. And so we're really excited to see what kind of ideas we can come up with today. Great. Well, thank you very much uh, for the, appreciate your time on the quick introductions. We have a great group that we can actually go around and see your perspectives and hear where you're coming from. So there are really no hard parameters here in terms of recommendations uh, or things that you see they're doing well. And we're not really limited to the military, the government, uh, or industry or academia here. So we're really looking for your thoughts and ideas to uh, express what's working well that you see that could be exemplars for the nation. And then what three things would you like to see that we could, as a group, come up and provide as uh, a recommendation to the rest of the attendees here at CERTS. So I'll give an opportunity to start, and so we can hear your perspective. We do have a mic, so other folks can hear where you're coming from. Sure. Uh, Andrew Smallwood with Booz Allen Hamilton. Um, from a retain perspective, um, I think one of the biggest things we can do is create better on and off ramps. So a number of years ago, I actually co-authored a report with uh, Partnership for Public Service on Cyber Workforce. Um, and one of the biggest issues that you're going to find is you can't compete for salary. We can't compete, Booz Allen, because of the outcasts that were given and other things. We can't compete for salary either. So that's never going to be something that um, is a primary lever you're going to be able to use. What I think that um, can be a, a means for competition is allowing people to uh, come in and out of the workforce, whether it's um, in uniform, in, um, as a civilian, or even as a contractor. There are some good things about uh, those positions in terms of stability and in terms of work-life balance and other things. So there are some times in people's <coughs> career where government work is very, very attractive. There are other times where, frankly, it's not. We can't compete with the, you know, the Bank of America or the Citibank or whatever. They're going to make X uh, times what, what we're able to offer our staff. Um, so I think being able to allow people to come in and come out based upon uh, what they need for work-life balance. The other area I think that um, can be a, a main lever to pull for competition is mission. Nobody has a more important mission than protecting our nation. And so being able to do that, whether that's in uniform, um, as a contractor, or as a civilian, um, I think that's, that's important as well. The other thing is being able to compete um, from a technology perspective. There are really cool tools and really cool problems you can solve, or play, really cool technologies you can play with, um, whether you're at NSA or Cybercom or Army Cyber Command. 
Um, so bringing those things to the fore and letting people know about it. I think the problem that we have, and I've had the conversation with when John Yelnowski was there and when uh, Christopher Dobbins and all of those guys, I'm a, I'm a comp guy uh, by background as well as a cyber guy. I used to do cyber in uniform. Um, yep, John's, yeah, he's, he's kind of bounced around. Uh, I think Christopher's still there too. Um, but you know, being able to leverage these other tools uh, or other levers rather than just, hey, I'm going to try to throw money at it because you're never going to throw enough money. Um, and frankly, compensation is just a satisfier. It's not really a motivator anyway. So people need a, a baseline amount of money, but you, know, you don't have to do things. But you do need to recognize their hard work, be able to um, leverage your awards program better as well. I don't think the, the government or even industry does that particularly well right now either. Thank you, Mr. So I think one of the things that I'm sort of curious about in terms of what you did at BH is do you have examples where that having available on and off ramps actually translated into something that you can actually measure, see? Do you ever see evidence of that? Yeah, absolutely. So um, we, we are the largest cybersecurity services provider um, in North America largest cybersecurity services provider to the government. And we do that not necessarily with salary, but with the ability to bring people in. So um, two really important missions. They want to do that for a while, but they don't want to do it for their whole career. And then we allow them to move on maybe to other areas or other clients where they're interested in, um, or even to our commercial practice where they can make more money and, and go do interesting things. Right. Um, our, we have some of the, the uh, best hackers in the world that work for Booz Allen that we then lease back to the government, um, you know, whether it be PAO or some other places, right? Um, but uh, we are able to retain them not through compensation but through being able to bring them in, um, allow them to work on something that they're interested in for a while until they're no longer interested in it, and then sure. move them on to other areas and other places where their skills can also be leveraged. Um, but that gets to the mission, too. Sure. You, have to, you have to tell them about the mission. Sometimes, though, with our classified mission, we don't do a good job talking about it because we're not allowed to. Um, so I think that um, if we were able to open that up a little bit and say, you know, you can really make a difference right, right now. You have you know, to prepare for it. So if you have a process in place where it sound, I think it came up in the morning session, there was a UK uh, process where folks can crash in the, from industry uh, based on a, a short-term need, but because they have that particular skill set, they have a mechanism in place to flow those individuals. Maybe they have their already clearances, they understand the organization, how to flow them in uh, when they're needed, and then once the event is over, they're able to transition back to where they came from. But I saw that as one example this morning, right, um, from the UK. Right, and, and it's important to make sure that, that you're leveraging all of the authorities that are out there. Sure. Um, so with the accepted service, whether that's on the intelligence side or on the cyber side, there are a lot of ways that government can be, uh, can, can leverage the authorities that you already have that people simply aren't doing because they don't know about it or because, yes, it does take a little bit of work, um, but doing that, I think, more effectively to yeah. bring in an HQE or bring in a, um, you know, a cyber person that's frankly, uh, you know, post-economic. They've already made the money mm -hmm. in at uh, sure. uh, Silicon Valley, but they still want to do good. Different phases in their careers where they're willing to participate in at a certain level. Yes, sir. I must be at the very beginning of that. <laughs> I can't hear you. Sure, absolutely. So the, w the way I like to do this, because we do have a small crowd, so we, we do have the opportunity to go in depth right, in, into the discussion. So when I do give you the mic w during the introductions, you know, identify if you're, if it's going to be a thing that you see doing well or a recommendation area, so at least we know where to couch the, your comments. But and if you have any thoughts or questions based on what you're hearing, please raise your hand and we'll make sure you get the microphone. I'll pirate what he said. DDS already has that kind of piecework approach. DDS. DDS, Delta Delta Sierra, you know, the digital Defense Digital Service has a model for in and out oh, okay. and tapping specific talent. <clears throat> the second piece is I just think our guard and reserve is a bridge from active service to, you know, commercial work. Uh, and 
you know, as someone who helped a little bit of this designing this thing, I, I got to get a, I got to amp up the garden reserve part <coughs> of strengthening building and understanding that bridge, the garden reserve solution is, is in here. Don't know exactly where, but it's a, it's. So one time, can you raise it? He's going to make a comment. OK, get out, get out. Yeah. So this is a great thought because we're probably going to get into details that the rest of the group's probably not as familiar. So when, once we finish all the introductions, we want to circle back to your particular uh, recommendation and articulate in such a way that not only your community but others can sort of understand how to put their recommendation into context. So we'll, we'll come back to yours. And uh, were there any other questions or comments to Andrews? Yes, sir. I have a different recommendation, so it's. Okay, we're, we're going to do introductions unless you wanted to uh, have any comment with regards to this particular issue right now. No, I was going to add a different. Okay, well, we'll come back to you when we finish the introductions. Is that all right? Okay, go ahead, sir. <clears throat> okay, well, you already heard me talk. I'm uh, Jonathan Thompson, South Carolina Air National Guard. I'm an intel guy uh, by trade. Uh, we're trying to break into the cyber uh, space. I probably shouldn't have said it like that. Um, but anyway, so we're, we're fairly local and we're trying to kind of get, uh, get some momentum going down here on the uh, other side of the river too. Uh, I'm Jimmy Quinn. I uh, spent 32 years in the Air Force and the last 15 in industry supporting the DOD as a, as a contract manager. And you work for BTAS, right? Yeah, no, don't work for me. <laughs> My name is Kelly Witt. I'm the Vice President of Human Resources for BTAS. We're a woman-owned woman -owned small business. Um, we contract primarily with the Air Force, but are always looking to expand and grow. Um, we've actually been a sub to Booz Allen on a number of occasions. Uh, when we talk about retention and the competition, certainly as a small business, we can't compete with a, you know, a large organization uh, like Booz Allen. Uh, However, I think some things that, that we do well because of the nature of being a small business is, as, as you mentioned, the awards program. Um, and it's not just about awards, but it's about the constant um, recognition of your employees. And again, being a small business, we have the opportunity to, for it to have a very family-like feel. And I think that is a benefit for us in retention where um, salary and benefits might uh, uh, and, and, you know, advanced training might be an area that we're not able to be real competitive in. You know, make sure at the end of the hour we come back to that one so we can seriously consider and rank, rank and see where it sits. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon. I'm Staff Sergeant Conan. I'm uh, with the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency. Um, I'm part of the Expeditionary Forces. We are the guys that deploy. Uh, my, my networks are mobile. Um, 
majority satellite. Um, I've been with NGA now here for about a year and a half, um, and I have seen a lot of turnover in the government because of that um, regulation, you can't stay in the, the job for too long. Um, I can't remember what it, yes. So I lost one of my best techs because he got promoted. So there's and a I find policy in place that actually caps out their service and they wanted to continue? Is that what you're saying? But they couldn't because of the policy? They, they, get, uh, they get promoted, they gotta find a new job. I see. They get promoted and they find a new job. And I find, I get a GS-14 coming back to his GS-13 position just to help us out. Yeah. Just to help us out. And it's mission oriented. It's, uh, it needs to get done. Right. And um, that's where I'm losing my talent. Well, this is a great opportunity because three years ago, we had Veronica Villalobos here from OPM. And, and so she took to heart our conversation at the national strategy level. And you can see the traction she's had over the last three years in implementing OPM initiatives and tools for the government, not only the military, to use to direct higher uh, uh, bonus funding uh, structures. And, and you saw some of the Army uh, initiatives this morning. So it does uh, help when you have an idea from one of these forums and get it up on here so we can communicate that to beyond this audience to folks on the Hill, folks over at OPM, folks in, at, at the Pentagon, you know, folks at the industry and their large organizations. So certainly hang on to that one because I certainly want to see if there's an opportunity to get that one up on the screen at the end of the day. Who's, who's next? Uh, good afternoon, I'm Rita Moss. I am the Chief Human Capital Officer for CISA, DHS, uh, Cybersecurity and In Infrastructure Security Agency. Excuse me. <clears throat> uh, so, you can imagine we have a whole agency dedicated to cybersecurity professionals. Uh, so we have a constant challenge of uh, filling those positions. Uh, a couple of things that we have done that I think have worked well, uh, we actually reward our employees up to 25% for certifications based on the NIST NICE framework. And we have reduced our um, attrition from about 25% down to about 15% now for our cyber professionals. Uh, we also utilize the direct hiring authorities to uh, eliminate some of the bureaucracy. Uh, people come to our job fairs now. They can get hired or get a tentative job offer on the spot. Uh, so we have reduced the amount of paperwork that's necessary for, to get them hired and on board. Of course, they still have to go through the security process. Uh, so that still is a lag in our, in our hiring. I think having a compelling mission also retain some of our employees as well as government employ employment is still a good place to work uh, for, for most people. So it's a steady job with great benefits. So I think that goes a long way, but it depends on where you are in your career and wh where you are in your family life. And if you get a 25 year old, stability may not be as important to a 45 year old that has two kids that are getting ready to go to college. Uh, so we find a high retention rate amongst our senior folks because they have those types of responsibilities. Um, what else? One of the things uh, the Colonel said resonated with me was about the hiring pipeline, that you don't have the priorities that you uh, need in terms of getting people in there. One of the things that we've started doing is over hiring. So instead, knowing that we're gonna lose 15%, put that many more people in the pipeline to start with. Uh, so by the end of the year, we're still whole. Uh, we're, we're not there yet, we're just implementing this in the last couple of months. Uh, but that's one of the strategies that we're trying to do to stay ahead of the attrition that we know is coming down the road. So you don't have any metrics yet on how well that initiative is working, but the thought was uh, shoot over the target for the sake of you know at the end of the day you're going to settle on a certain amount due to turnover or whatever reason exactly. uh, doesn't work out. Exactly. And, and we heard a comment like that this morning where there was no mechanism for uh, hiring managers to let go. Say say the military did invest, provide a recruitment bonus, got the individual to come in, but for whatever reason, didn't work out, right? Now, it sounded like the problem was that he was stuck and there was no off-ramp uh, for the government or the military at that point and they're stuck maybe for one or two years or more uh, because of that situation. So that's a great thought if you're able to uh, 
initiate something that, thank you, ma'am. And we don't implement the three-year rule, but I guess oh. that's a DOD thing, so people can stay as long ah. as they like. Okay. By the, by the way, we had Noelle Kyle here uh, three years ago, and she spoke on a national strategy, and Zia Anderson, uh, also from your office, has been a great participant in the Cyber Workforce Committee. And so she's a, she spoke at uh, AFSIA events in the past, and so thank you for your organization's volunteerism and to participate, to share the knowledge from, from DHS. Yes, sir. Uh, my name's uh, Lieutenant Colonel Cottrell. I work at Army Cyber, so just here to learn how we uh, work to retain uh, both our civilians and our soldiers. Uh, I think it's interesting that every company has said, like, we can't afford the cyber professionals that we need. So I'm curious to learn about this mythical company that's buying up all these people. Hi, my name is Paul. Sorry, my name is Paul Gupta. I'm with a company called Premier Federal. We are a small business contractor focused in cybersecurity and cyber compliance. I, I guess I have a recommendation or a suggestion. Um, I know that big companies they always can reach out and go to big colleges and recruit, you know, the folks. But when we need resources, we always go to like um, uh, community colleges or technical colleges and bring people as interns to us, and then we train them. Uh, I'm just wondering if, if a public-private partnership business model could work in, in filling up the pipeline, leveraging the small businesses like us. So it sounds like a question regarding uh, using apprenticeships, internships as an opportunity and finding a partnership to leverage the internships with other organizations to increase the pipeline? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Well, it, it could be partnered with the off-ramp piece where maybe folks don't know where to go and, and, and if you have these opportunities available for them, it could be alternatives, but I, I'm not sure, I'm just guessing at this point. But maybe that's a conversation that we can have uh, in a little bit after we finish the introductions. But, but thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. I've got to leave in just a minute. I'm Rob yes, Dennis, and hey, Rob. I head up corporate relations for Augusta University. And one of the things that we work on a lot is how we put First, the internships and fellowships that y'all were just talking about together so that you can groom a student into your program. But then the other thing that works very well for us is how we put together uh, our work with government on IPAs to sh have shared resources. And increasingly, that's becoming a great vehicle for us to share our subject matter experts and vice versa. Uh, and then I think the other thing that academia affords the overall effort is with a training initiative or a education initiative or content delivery, we're able to offer credit for courses that folks participate in. So if you have a, an enlisted soldier who really does want to pursue their bachelor's degree but they don't realize how much work they've already done for their MOS, we've articulated with the Army and are able to afford a fair number of credits that way and with some of the training courses as well. So I think it's I don't want to use the word symbiotic, but it's something no, like that. You just did. Yeah. <laughs> so, so it's, so, uh, it's really IPA. analyzing IPA. analyzing a service member's <laughs> uh, already training, and because I know there's a program already that does that, that sort of equates training to credits yes. when they do sort of an evaluation of how far along they are towards a, a degree level, yes. right? So it sounds like the school offers that service. As well. Yes. Oh, absolutely, and and we pursue that heavily. But really, the interagent, intergovernment personnel act is something that works out very well for us as well. And sharing, you know, there's just a finite number of of resources or subject matter experts. So the way that we're able to exchange and share those services is, I think, it's a win-win for both of us, and it allows people. You know, earlier we were talking about work-life balance, and I think work-life balance ends up being a lot of this, because folks, I think folks who see the guys on the academic side, they they got it made. 
And folks who are on the academic side look at industry or government and they go, they've got it made. And so it does, you know, it provides an opportunity to sort of cross-pollinate. So before you leave, because you said you were going to leave, I, I think this is an opportunity to sort of get on the what can we do to improve area, maybe given your visibility. Is there one or two recommendations you would offer that we could sort of highlight as a potential area to improve from, base, from your perspective in the academic area? You know, I think the articulation agreements go so far in providing those soldiers a path forward and they they stay in they get promoted within their ranks and uh, we're happy because we have students and uh, you know so I think cultivating and building an awareness around that is is part of it okay. and also they're inter if, if you're going to lose them to industry anyway you know there are opportunities where they go do an internship for industry and it may be that once they get in there they find out uh, so if they're 45 and they've got two kids, it's not yeah. as attractive as they thought it might be. So, Colonel, were you able to capture that one? Yeah. Yeah, IPAs. All right. Well, thank you, sir. I appreciate yeah. the I time. Apologize. Comment. Who, who's next? Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm uh, Chris Smith. I work at uh, Datapath as a Security Operations Center Manager. Um, retired Navy, so I've got a little bit of experience with some of this as far as retention is concerned from the military side as well as the uh, corporate side of things. We have a lot of turnover with young folks, uh, especially first-term enlistees as well as those just getting out and getting their feet wet in the corporate environment. So uh, I'm eager to see where this goes in some of this discussion. Uh, okay. To answer uh, some of the questions that were already brought up with regards to co-ops and partnering with uh, university systems, uh, UNG, Georgia Tech, we have a lot of co-ops from them. So we kind of get them in early, get them engaged, and, uh, and really s have them apply the technical uh, not, or the uh, educational information that they get in the environment in the school environment and apply it directly there in kind of a supervised uh, opportunity. And it really gives them kind of buy into what we're doing and supporting our DOD partners and supporting the mission set and uh, ultimately offering them a position afterwards. Great. Hi, I'm Bill Bassinet with Datapath. I'm in the talent acquisition side. I actually processed his offer letter. Did it go through? Uh, yeah, eventually. Oh, okay, good. So. Um, so I'm, mine's, my, question, my concerns are much more practical. So we are a small defense contractor. We specialize in secure high-speed satellite end-to-end -end communications. You know, he makes sure it's, it's safe. But we struggle with when we do land a contract that we need to quickly hire and deploy uh, qualified, cleared technicians all around the world. And we're doing that right now. Our biggest struggle right now is when we do go to a new source, they typically don't have clearances or their clearance is no longer active. And um, I've been doing this for a while, so I can remember the early days when we went into Iraq, it seemed like the clearance came, clearances came much faster. You know, 90 days, someone would have an interim secret. And then three months later, they would have, a, you know, they would process to a secret. Now it seems to have slowed down to 6 to 12 to 18 months. So I, my question to the group is, has anybody cracked the code on how to hire uh, someone with very strong skills that wants to serve, but they don't have a clearance? So I was, I've been looking at this retention thing as an industry problem, not okay. just a company problem. Sure. And we made it very easy for people with that worked for the DOD as a contractor or in the government to get out of this business, but we make it extraordinarily difficult for them to get back. Mm -hmm. So we went through the LPTA days, and so we're no longer paying a premium mm -hmm. for this talent, and so they left. Right. And they went over to no, bid, no kidding commercial. Mm -hmm. Now we're getting out of the LPT days. I got a guy that had a clearance three years ago, and I can't hire him for another year. I mean, we've got, to, we've got to find a way to redo clearances that have already been had in the past quicker than starting over. So, so that's, that's under my spin. the things to improve or challenges, definitely we're going to consider the clearance issue 
as something that we need to improve. So our challenge is, as a group, how can we articulate the recommendation at the end of the day yeah. so that somebody at, um, at DOD and, and, the, and the IC that's running, the, I think it's a combined team um, that's trying to come up with a clearance, they have a task force put together, right, to address this issue. So at least we can offer a recommendation. Absolutely. Yes. Right. Yeah. 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 Now the the backlog issue was identified many years ago, and but because of the OPM hack and the reorganization uh, of the clearance process and trying to find it, but I know. It's been almost two years now I've been hearing about this task force. I'm sort of curious if anybody has the insight, but we're certainly going to address it as a, t yeah. as a recommendation. Yeah, absolutely. So we can highlight the particular issues since more than a couple folks have raised it. Sure. Thank you, sir. So I've been doing it since 2006, and it's the worst. It's the slowest it's ever been. Absolutely. Yes. Andrew. So a cyber civilian reserve corps that's that, tied back to your company? No, that no. that companies could then hire those people from, but also so could the government. But what it would do would be you would have an affiliation with this corps so that rather than your uh, clearance being clearance. contingent upon a contract, it would be through that affiliation with I that re, uh, civilian reserve corps. And that would also allow you to come in and go out of government to do these crashes on, hey, we're, we're having a national emergency. We yeah. need to do something. Bring in the best and the brightest. Well, if they're affiliated with this, they already have the tickets. They already have hmm. some basic understanding and knowledge, but it's not necessarily the same. So I'm a, I'm a former guardsman and reservist as well. Um, there were a lot of requirements put on me in terms of training, in terms of physical um, you know, testing and all of that that kind of took away from my time that I could dedicate towards right. um, doing things either for, for the, the National Guard or, or whatever. If you took some of those requirements out, it would make the barrier to entry a lot less and would also help with that onboarding and offboarding because there would be a central place with people that you know, we've identified as, as a talented source. And it wouldn't just have to be for DOD. It could be for DHS or, wow. or for other organizations as well. That, that's a great thought. So I look at the recommendations for improvements, not only identifying the problem and what they could possibly do with it, but uh, maybe offering a recommendation of what, what is also working well uh, in, to resolve that problem as a sample, right, that they could look at. And so, so in addition to the recommendation, here's an example that you could possibly look at. So it's a great workaround. You know, while the improvement process is occurring on this side, industry and others have figured out here's a process or a mechanism to overcome the short-term issues regards to the uh, clearance and I'm retaining. That doesn't exist right now. There is no civilian reserve corps to adopt. That. That's why I put it in the improvement side because we don't have any exemplars yet on yeah, what's working best as a, as a best practice, right? That's why I recommend that at least at this point we maybe put it on the improvement side. Yes, sir. I'm Bob Wood with AFCIA um, and uh, suffered through uh, so many descriptions of this similar problem on clearances. One of the things that popped out in some of the discussion, just for example, at Fort Hood, 8,000 soldiers process out, process out every year, and, and, and it's 20,000 in the D.C. area. A lot of folks have clearances. Uh, and what we heard here in our discussions was, you know, it, you don't have to have a computer science degree necessarily. You don't necessarily have been coding all your life. You, you simply are, have an aptitude, attitude, motivation, and passion. I think I heard something like that. So uh, the reskilling idea of someone who, everyone who comes in the military goes to the ASVAB, tells you where you're supposed to go. Everyone who exits the military ought to go through the 
Glenn Hernandez, I mean, Glenn, Glenn uh, test to make sure that your attitude, aptitude, passion are identified and perhaps your security clearance can go sure. with you. Uh, so uh, I, think, I think we've got a large pool of talent that have already gotten up in the morning, done their physical training, understand discipline, job, and mission, who possibly are a pool that's under tapped by DOD. You know, I, I um, solve lots of different problems in my past, and one of the best ways we were able to identify the problem was to do an audit and identify inefficiency or vulnerabilities with the current process. So I was thinking as you were talking, how much taxpayer investment goes into that process to get those individuals cleared to maintain that clearance and, and how much, you know, as taxpayers we put into that process to, and just to let it go you know, at 8000 a yeah. clip? I, I think you could make the economic argument and convince a lot of people. Uh, one, one last point. We heard uh, General Eubanks say in his talk, he says he just wants them first. Right. He wants to have that talent first and get them, you know, baseline in terms of skill sets, really trained in terms of the skill itself and execution, and possibly then hand them off to industry. So the government-industry partnership and the, thinking of this as a life cycle instead of an episode that can move through and to uh, jobs. So I would like to make sure that we capture that one uh, under the recommendation so that we, when we look at that, we put that as, uh, pro as an example how we can possibly mitigate uh, the problem. That's great, great observation. Yes, sir. He said that companies will pay to get somebody a clearance. Buy what? To, to buy, a government would have to approve or something or an organization. Into buying in as a company. And so the same for the investigators for as well. The government still hiring them. That's why they have the bank Because it, yeah, because I see this as a government run uh, mandate, right? Because only the government is requiring this, and so that's the companies inherit that mandate, but they're not having to pay uh, for the process. Did I capture that right? So you just layered that on top of DHS's, you know, so she's, she's not here, where they're shooting 15% over target with a one out of eight opportunity. Yeah. Incredible. All right. Yes, sir. So Edward Sobiesk from the Army Cyber Institute up at West Point. Um, great conversation. The, I guess the things that I would add on this topic just very quickly would be uh, I teach and I see sometimes students try and solve the wrong problem on a test. You know, they misread the problem. And so I would, I was very uh, taken aback when the chief of staff said, I want to retain the top 80 percent, I want to retain 80 percent of the top 50 percent. And the reason I bring this up is that probably nothing might be more zapping than to have everybody be treated the same. Yeah. So I think that part of this problem that isn't ever discussed is how do we identify who we want to retain? Mm -hmm. uh, if so often you just, oh, we want to retain everybody. And I, I think that even just the identification of somebody as being wanted to be retained might be a retainable sort of thing. You know, just being identified, we appreciate that you are in our top 15% or in our top 25%. You know, what would it take for us to keep you for another assignment? I had a cadet that I mentor who's in the cyber force who had told me a year and a half ago he was getting out. Uh, he was the last of his four-person cohort to, to be getting out, and he was, said, I made it the longest anyway. Well, I talked to him a couple days ago, and he stayed in. And you know how he stayed in was that Branch did exactly that. They offered him an assignment he just couldn't pass up. Hmm. And, you know, uh, that we've talked about it, but I just wanted to testify that, 
you know, one of our top cyber people stayed in because, and it wasn't about more pay or anything else, it was just he heard the opportunity, he said, we can't discuss in an unclass venue what I'm doing, but just trust me, I couldn't pass up that opportunity. Um, I would put that down as a best practice if we continue to do that and but expand the uh, initiatives so that we're communicating, you know, retain based on the opportunity, not based on number or, you know, quota yeah. for, for certain positions. But if we're briefing this to everybody, then everybody's going to think they're special. And then, once again, the people who are special are going to say, I'm just like everybody else. And so, I mean, it has to be very carefully discussed how we're identifying, you know, the targets to retain. A uh, couple other things. Just, I heard one of the speakers this morning talk about how if somebody stays someplace five years and then they went forward and listed four different jobs the person had, I really think that's a mistake, too. Uh, if I was to write a, a biography of my military career, it would be 50% competent. And the reason why is because the half the time I'm in the job, I'm trying to learn it, and then as soon as I learn it, they start talking about what I'm going to do next. And, you know, in the cyber force, I'm not sure that's a good model. <laughs> so it's something to think about. I don't think you can be truly creative until you are competent in a job. So we're also removing the ability for many of our most talented people to be creative because they first establish their competence and then they start establishing creativity and innovation and things like that. So so you're saying that they're not there long enough? They're not there long to enough. To yeah. realize their the, full the potential? The Army is very quick to want to move people developmentally to get them as many box checks as possible to show that they did all these different things. I mean, it was on the stage this morning. We heard it. So um, uh, last wrap-up comments. Um, with at least the O-rank officers, and maybe we should do this with everybody, if you want to retain somebody, just get them to go for a master's degree. You got them for another 18 months until they leave, then they're in for two years, and then you got them for six years afterwards, and by then, who's getting out? So, you know, that's the secret to sucking somebody in. Find a way to get them to go for a master's degree, and they're, they're going all in. And, you know, one of the things we need to do is we need to have the way to get a master's degree but not have to take a broadening assignment afterwards. One of the most talented cyber officers I know was on the rise, and he's been away from the force for a total of six years doing masters, three years broadening, one year schooling. And, and that's just, I think we need to find ways to let them go for a master's degree and then go right back into the fire if they so choose or do a broadening assignment. And uh, last two things, we need to do a better job of having senior mentors. I had a senior mentor engage with me in staying in the Army when I had been in for four years. It happened to be when I was at the very front line and we were looking at enemy, but it was still, we need senior mentors engaging one-on-one -on -one with the people we want to retain. And senior once again, mentors. I think that should be targeted, not just senior mentors telling everybody, oh, you should stay in and you should stay in and you yeah. should stay in. It needs to be personal relationship conversations. And although some of the military will hate to say it, if we could be more like SF when it comes to some of the standards, I mean, SF is some of our very best, but they're not always in uniform. They don't always have perfect grooming standards. You know, I just, I got to throw it out there, and we, we need to think about, are there environments in which we can let people kind of unwind just a little bit more? Uh, absolutely. Thanks. So I want to make sure we got the mentor part under best practice. You got that, Colonel? Oh, okay. All right. Okay. <laughs> thank, thank you, Ed. Yes, sir. Hi, uh, my name is Sterling Packer. I'm with Mantech, um, the site lead here in Augusta. Um, but to the topic of retention, and this is, this is important to me in industry, um, but I've got some recent experience with this. I was a team leader for a cyber protection team, um, came out of that position about two years ago, and started to observe this retention problem. And, and for me and for the people that I was talking to, the number one issue in the Cyber Protection Brigade at the time was mission. So there was plenty of training opportunities. There was lots of, lots of fun training to do. But eventually the training got tired, and guys just wanted to go execute what they'd been trained to do. Yeah. And um, the, way that, the way that I retained my people was, was by putting them on mission and making an effort to make sure that they were doing their jobs um, I, I think it's really easy to spend so much time thinking about training and what do we need to know and not enough time about getting on the network and, and applying that. And, and if we can solve that, 
Um, I, I think I think that's and that, that's that's really just a leader issue. That's not anything anything that uh, is is difficult to do. It's just a leader finding a way to put people to use their skills and, and put them to work. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. That, that's a huge stereotype. I'll, I'll, I'll that. Um, so, so what I saw, and, and especially talking about the younger ones, I saw guys that put on the uniform because they wanted to serve. They didn't join the military because they wanted GI Bill. They didn't join because they didn't have anything else they wanted to do. They wanted to be a part of the mission. They wanted to be wearing the uniform, doing the mission for the country. And that and it sounds trite, but that patriotism is what, what attracted them. They could have gone and worked anywhere. I had, a, I had a kid that came in as a PFC, and he knew more than my warrant officers that had been in for 10, 15 years. <laughs> so, well, I wasn't there long enough to experience that. So uh, I, I was on a team for 18 months. Uh, I came in observing these problems. Uh, there had been retention problems on the team, and it was a team of about 20 um, prior, so prior to my arrival. And my, and my problem set was, how do I keep these guys wanting to stay in the military? And the answer ended up being, I have to keep them engaged on the mission. So I didn't have a problem with burnout. The problem that I had was, how do I get them doing enough of what they want to be doing, which over time could have turned into burnout, but but I, did, I didn't run into that. So um, I, I really can't answer that question just based on the, the amount of time that I was with the team. Well, I do see an opportunity there where the mentor's recommendation could come into play is that if the mentor was really involved, they could advise and maybe work within the organization to say, hey, I know another opportunity and start aligning things because the person may not be aware uh, but where senior leaders do have awareness of a more broader perspective of the organization and the mission set, they could possibly offer some recommendations to their mentee uh, for things to look at beyond, but still stay in, right? But because they weren't aware and not having that relationship with the mentor-mentee relationship, it, that process didn't exist. At least that's what I'm hearing as a possible. No, I, I agree with that 100%. Um, I, I had some guys that said I really don't want to do DCO anymore. I want to go do something else. And yeah. my job was not to convince them that they needed to stay and do DCO. Yeah. My job was to set them up for success and what they wanted to do. Yeah. And in doing that, I, I wasn't retaining them in the unit, but I was retaining them in the uniform. But even then, the guys that were just like, I've had enough of this. I, I just want to go try something else. My philosophy was I still am retaining cyber talent that can be used in industry. Um, a, a cyber defender working for a bank is just as important as a cyber defender in uniform. So, yeah. so how, do we, how do we keep the talent in the, the, the universal cyber force, which isn't that hard because there's, right. there's a lot of other incentives in other places, but, but I don't think it's wrong for the army to train up a guy for four or five years, teach him all these skills, and then he bolts and goes to goes to work for um, Citigroup. Yeah, that's okay. Citigroup needs him just as much as the military. It's part of the national infrastructure. So again, from my experience uh, with the Coast Guard, it'd be great to have a requirements-based talent pool, not based on billet rotation, right? So that you're constantly keeping a bubble on what the greatest need is for the organization, and having a talent pool of you know. Here are, remember that thing you were telling me about that partnership? And so now the talent management is between those two pools, availability and demand. But our system is currently not 
arranged like that. But I'm just offering a thought outside the box uh, to try and overcome. But I want to really finish introductions because we do actually have a task in about 30 minutes. So anybody else that hasn't introduced themselves that want to so we can move forward? All right, I'm going to have Diana and Janelle go over the things that we've captured so far. And we're welcome, you're welcome to add, change, modify as we go through the comments. And then we're going to start with the best practices first and uh, come up with three things that we think. Um, and then, uh, so if we can start on the best practices, get at the microphone, Janelle. Our best practices are on this board right here. And then we had three boards of recommendations. Um, can everybody read it or do you want me to go through them? Go through them? Because they okay. can't see it. Okay, so the first one was the career movement, easy to uh, do a job that interests you. Second one was rewards, and um, one of you talked about up to 25% for uh, NIST certifications, NIST NICE. The third one was using your instant hires at job fairs. Um, Overhiring, that was a big one. I think that that's definitely going to make one of our top three because we heard it a couple times. Civilian Reserve Corps, I, that actually probably should be on a recommendation slide. When, when you started talking about it, I thought maybe you had it, but... Uh, focus retention opportunities. So somebody mentioned the assignment. You know who you want to retain, so you cater to that person, whether it's assignments or some other way. And um, but we actually had somebody where it worked with an assignment. And then the th the last one was the soft people are doing something right. When you're in soft, you don't want to leave. So how do we get that into our environment? Are, are you, you doing that now? We are. So I, I think you heard my colleague earlier today on the panel talking about the fact that we're starting to deploy assessments against our workforce so that we know who has those skills. We're also working with uh, some parts of the government to help deploy that um, in the government as well. Mm -hmm. um, I just need to be careful to explain that to them. Mm. Are, are you basing your assessments on the NICE framework? How often do you test them? Um, right now, we're doing it for a small uh, population. Um, we, we don't have a whole lot of runtime on it. We, we've done it for about a year. Um, mm -hmm. It's a small population. We're moving it to a broader population. Um, but you know, periodically, you have to because people's yeah. skills change. They get updated. Yeah. It also needs to be more of a whole life cycle. You know, it needs to be a hands-on assessment. You can't just yeah. do like I'm a CIS OT, but you don't want right. me to send I was going to ask how you did the initial NICE assessment. Was it self-report, uh, or was there some tool that you used we, we to figure out what categories and yeah. what work roles? Yeah, we built an assessor and aligned it to So the BHS has a tool that you use to provide the assessments? Yes. OK. Um, so we're modifying it. And I mean, okay. I don't want to get ahead of myself. Sure, sure. No, it's great um, that you're other using other it. Organizations out right. There. So you're retaining the right people. You're retaining the right people in the right place. Because okay. some attrition is good. Sometimes you want to kind of encourage people to move on because they're maybe not the best performer. So that's part of your talent management dashboard exactly. is keeping a tally on where your workforce uh, capabilities are against a nice framework. That's great if you're able to maintain that. At That's a recommendation, but right now we're doing best practices. So it's the best practices identified as the only thing. 
are we going to do recommendations as well? Because no, we're doing best practice. So what's working well? So we're okay. So if this is working well for BH, uh, BH is do we find that other organizations are able to implement something similar, or is it just a one-off? That somebody said it was working well for them. They can hire on the spot. They're getting people in right away. That was just a best practice for the lady who was sitting over here. Yeah. You're over. Yeah. Okay. That's a recruiting attract, uh, recruiting initiative. True. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm sort of struggling with the over-hiring as the retention uh, best practice, too. Okay. Sir. Right. Okay. Did we get through all of them, uh, Colonel? Yeah, so I think that the argument is on our number one, um, over our number two, maybe that's not more, maybe that's not retention, maybe that's more of getting them in, so maybe we take that one off. So based on what the colonel put down as best practice, do we see any obvious ones that we'd like to articulate as our number one best practice? Yeah. Right. I, that's why, I mean, I, I think that's the problem right now is that we're not having enough definition to the term career movement or talent management. So, how do you want to articulate? Help us out. Yes, sir. Okay, so depending on the organization, career movement could be a best practice to retain. Maybe it could be a, be a best practice or not maybe it could be a best practice. Can I go ahead and do Yes. Uh huh. You know, when I was just saying was, yes, it's weird, but also in a company like the mm -hmm. job or or like whatever, somebody might be tired of being at a specific job for the company, but they want to do something different within the company. So if they can't say they want to do a project that's different and exciting that keeps them in the company, then that, that group that they own there right. might, might not be happy because they keep them in the company. Yeah, so at at the broader level in the organization they have an opportunity to implement an initiative like that where they identify an individual that potentially has a passion, but I think it's based on requirement as well. The organization also has to have a need. So it's not all based on the employee's you know, wishes. The organization also has to have a say on what the requirement is, but trying to match those two up could be the pathway to make that happen. But, but the organization needs to be mature enough to even offer that uh, a career movement opportunity.
I don't think we have that best practice, though, right? We um, haven't heard today. Okay. Is it, do you want to put the term bottom up? Okay. Did you get that, Jacob? Flexibility of choice. Yes, sir. And, and we've seen, seen examples of that. Uh, I don't know if you have any personal knowledge here in the local area, the difference between trying to move from Northern Virginia down to Augusta, that location issue has probably cropped up as a retention issue of those personnel uh, trying to come down here, right? So we do have a task. We have 15 more minutes. We need to go from the best practices to recommendations and improvements. Are we okay with these? Four so far? Do you want to make any changes to this four? Um, I think we were bound by three. Any, any thoughts on eliminating? Okay, so we'll keep it, but we'll just brief the top three. Okay. Promotions? Okay. Rewards, recognition, promotions, etc. Yeah, you can just put it in there. Promotion. Yeah, that's a good point. Well, we got the promotions on there. All right, we're going to go to the next slide, which should be, okay, major problem areas. Can okay, do you want me to bring up what we... Go ahead. Okay, so some of the major issues, I'd say a lot of you talked about was mission. We got to get them excited about the mission. That came up a few times. Talk about it. We got to put people on mission. So can we identify the problem beyond just the term mission? How would we articulate the problem statement? Are we not communicating the mission? Are we not identifying the mission requirement uh, clearly so that folks know that it's available and it has a need? What are we not doing? That's a that's yeah. yeah. So I would say the problem is not clearly articulating the mission and not allowing individuals to perform 
the mission that's required. I, I, I probably got 80% there, but. Um, yes. Okay, so, so not clearly articulating the mission and, and not aligning individuals to directly perform the mission a, as needed. Because it sounds, because I remember the, inter, the conversation we were having about too long burnout and, and not being able to be ready all the time to perform the mission. And, and I think this is an organizational question between training and execution if, if the organization is going to maintain a certain level of capability consistently executing all the time, there's got to be a process and a plan in place that constantly rotates individuals. You know, you, you have your multiple teams so that the capability at all times is at a certain level. So they're experienced. Okay. All right. Did we did we capture it? Or do we need to make any changes to what's on the board, on the screen right now? Okay, Colonel Diana, did we get through all of them yet? Well, so there's another one that we talked about leveraging authorities and systems that are in place. Do is that something that is so hard for us? I know in my organization, I I'm like asking them to give up their left arm to use an SFS person. You know, it's like it's not being told that they should. It's me trying to break down walls to get them to use these programs that are there. Do you guys see that too? Yeah. I, if it's not a big problem, though, we can save it for something else. This is um, within SOCOM. So we can hire interns using scholarship for service. We could also do, um, you know, the direct hire and things like that. But it's very hard to get people who are used to the old way of doing business to be accepting of these new authorities and programs. Yeah. They they don't know, but they are not being pushed to use it. Why isn't the CIO telling the organizations? use this program. So can you articulate that uh, in a way that it's a problem against retention again, Colonel? How, how is leveraging authorities and recommendations? So it's not? I, I guess maybe it'd be more of hiring. Like the bonuses, is anybody struggling with the bonuses and getting those used? Right. Okay. So not leveraging existing authorities and retention recommendations, or not leveraging existing retention authorities and recommendations. Maybe is that better? Okay. So. Major problems, not leveraging existing authorities and recommendations, right, existing retention authorities and recommendations. So the, the tools are out there. OPM has it. The military has it. But for whatever reason, either the hiring managers or HR hasn't gotten together with their hiring um, managers to figure out, why aren't you using these tools? So this sort of, a, you know, the HR world needs to have that conversation with the uh, requirements folks in trying to meet the needs so that they understand yeah, it's the, the that these tools yeah we'll put it up we'll put it up okay number three what was that because we had clearances on there we had focus it, but was it retention or getting people in
Okay. So uh, maybe So as a retention problem, can can we say that clearances? Oh, we took it off already. So can we put in parentheses uh, what what you just mentioned? Yeah, we said keep the previous cleared pool alive. So if they've been previously cleared, we can still use them. Lapsing of previously cleared personnel. Okay, all right. So some organizations, you know, you know, the organization I came from, Coast Guard, there's a certain level of capability you have to maintain all the time, right? And so it's a balance between training and execution and having a organization process and policies in place that maintains that capability so that you're not having those ebbs and flows or ro even rotational balances uh, impacting the operational capability, and so there is that focus. So if you're mission support, and you want to be mission support, know that you're gonna be capped at some level in the operational field. And so I, I need to be, finish this. Did we capture the four? All right, so can we go back to the first slide, right, uh, for the best practices, right? This is the four that we had, and I'll, I'll, I'll brief out. And then what we'll also do is we're going to capture everything that you gave us today, right? And then we'll give it to AFSIA so that it's all available to you on the website so that you can come back to it and, and so that your comments, we didn't attribute it to who gave us these comments, so it's not attribution in that sense. Um, are you okay with the best practice slide that we're going to go over? Yes, sir. Yeah. Well, that's. Well, let me let me add. Well, we can let them stay in, stay in the role. So that, yeah. That creates a question for the Coast Guard. Does that help? Not always. Does no, it's. Well, let me ask this question. It looks like bullet one is career and talent. I'm I'm not saying change it. I'm just saying this is how my brain has seen it. Mm -hmm. Career and talent management. Sub bullet A, B, and C is individual flexibility and choice, cyber and skill based assessment, and then the outcome of that is making the rewards based decision. Oh, I see. Are okay. Those, are those three like subcomponents of how the best practices are in talent management right now, as opposed to it could, separate? Yeah, I mean, in your mind, I, I see what you're seeing as well, right? There's subcategories under the main topic. We, we're, we're just providing three. Right, so, yeah. It's hard to see flexibility and choice in the I know. I, I think it's. 
six half dozen, half dozen. I, I think we're, we're fine. It's up there. We got it articulated. Um, so, so go to the second slide, or the last slide. Make sure, all right, major problem areas. Do, do we want to classify it as problem areas, or do you want to say things to improve, make it nicer, or are we going to stick with, hey, fix this? Did we miss it? What was that one? Cyber skill based? Oh, okay. Cyber assessments define skills? No. Use, no. Yeah. So can we put a sub? Put a parenthesis? You're talking about number three? Right? Number three? Okay. Identify who we want to keep. Yeah, Put that in parentheses. That would be the point, one of the points of skills based assessment, not the only one. But that idea right. is one of the skills that I was right. But we, we captured your. Where you want to keep it. Right, because you don't have. Yeah. 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 That, guy, that went to my point earlier about identifying the requirement. You know, what capability we need, where is it needed, have that at the forefront and prioritize against all those, and then have that pool of talent that's available, uh, ready to you know, be assigned and fill it, whether you're military, industry. Um, I think, do we have an academic, uh, Diana? Do we have an academic anything here that, that you could take away from? Or from the school? From any of these two slides? Okay, it applies to school, academic settings as well? All right, so we're going to wrap up. I appreciate everybody's input and participation in this. We're going to brief out the two slides. And just as an opportunity, uh, AFSIA does do this all year. Uh, AFSIA, uh, I run the Workforce Subcommittee as part of AFSIA International. And we have participation from DHS, DOD, NSA, uh, military, industry, and academia on action items that we carry on from year to year from certs, and so throughout the year, we're actually working on these assignments that you give us in terms of priorities. And so take that uh, as an opportunity to sort of, do you want to help with that? Please see me. If you want to be aware of it, contact me, and I'll share with you whatever the subcommittee is doing. Uh, we do try to communicate our efforts, and FC has been grateful in having opportunities and panels at other events throughout the year beyond certs. Uh, we could do it through Cyber Edge and Signal Magazine, you know, or we can even have webinars. Uh, maybe a webinar on a workforce, workforce topic, sir, uh, that's coming out of certs sometime this year. That would be great, too. Any, any thoughts, questions before we depart the session? And I want to thank, no, none? I want to thank our facilitators, Diana, Colonel Nelson, great job. And I really appreciate your participation. Hopefully you enjoyed search this year. And thank you very much. We look forward to seeing you next year.